others to operate by the rules. Sign number two, safety and security risks. A study on Boko Haram attacks in Nigeria in the period between 2006 and 2013 by Chatham House in the United Kingdom revealed that 17 states in the north were terror prone and recorded varying degrees of violent attacks leading to violent deaths. In terms of frequency of attacks, Borono, Yobe, Kano, Kaduna, Adamawa, and Bauchi, in that order, led the other states. For the compilation of recorded incidents from other sources showed that towards mid-2014, Boko Haram attacks had become an almost daily occurrence in Bruno State. Terror attacks of threats, uh, terror attacks or threats of same was also reported in northern states that had been previously free of such, including Kogi, Nasarawa, as well as in southern states such as Lagos, Delta, and Imo. Given the new ta- tactics being adopted by the Boko Haram sect, especially suicide bombing by teenage girls, who it appears the sect is increasingly targeting for abduction, the risk factor in massive political rallies and in polling units across the north of the country, and to a lesser extent in the south, is dangerously high. Let us not forget that in December 2014, a female suicide bomber arrested by vigilante forces in Borno State revealed that 50 other female suicide bombers had been let loose. As INEC had requested of the federal government a massive deployment of armed forces and security agents for the general elections, a proposal that has been opposed by opposing parties, I challenge the federal government to conduct an honest assessment of the capability and numerical, numerical strength of each of the security agencies and armed forces and assure Nigerians that the ratio of forces to polling units across the Federation is such that can effectively ward off potential attacks and guarantee security. The logic would be to deploy more forces to areas that are highly prone to terror, but security tacticians must not forget that the seed is a weapon of war. Terrorists might seek to take the nation by surprise and target less protected areas which ordinarily might have been less terror prone. Let the security agents also be mindful of what I would refer to as the Ziklag factor. If they want to know it, it's an opportunity for you to study 1 Samuel chapter 30. When you leave your base unprotected, (laughs) it it will be totally destroyed by invading terrorists. If security agencies are to be massively deployed to polling units on election day, it will be risky to leave the home front unprotected in terror-prone areas as terror attacks might be unleashed on homes to target the non-voting population. Worse still, with their antecedents of becoming partisan and getting caught up in politicking during elections, Can our security agents maintain the level of alertness required to quell potential attacks? We might have succeeded in organizing some gubernatorial elections in the South. And the aborted gubernatorial election in Adamawa, due to the subsequent swearing in of the deputy governor by massively deploying militaries and civil defense forces, however, we cannot ignore these threats ahead of the general elections. Sign number three, the likely minority king-making. Likely minority king-making. Nigeria has a history of lower turnout. I mean, voter turnout. For instance, the 2011 parliamentary elections recorded 25.8% turnout, while the presidential elections recorded 48.32%. In essence, electoral decisions in Nigeria are made by the minority. Given the state of the nation, in spite of the excitement trailing the emergence of candidates, 
The 2015 elections threatened to record an even worse turnout. Aside the problems associated with voter registration and PVC collection, if the reported hundreds of thousands of displaced persons in terror-prone areas are considered with respect to their status as part and parcel of the electorate, and if terror-stricken towns are considered in terms of polling units involved, then we are faced with the likelihood of massive disenfranchisement and voter apathy that will render the elections disputable and inconclusive. Sign number four, looming constitutional and legal crisis. The constitutional provisions for election into the office of the president as articulated in section 120, 132 of the 1999 constitution provides a window for challenging the validity of any presidential election if elections cannot be held in some parts of the country as might be the case if the security situation is not addressed before the election. Section 132, subsection 4 provides, and I quote, For the purpose of an election to the office of the president, the whole of the federation shall be regarded as one constituency. Section 47 of the Electoral Act 2010 provides that voting in any particular election under this act shall take place on the same day and time throughout the Federation. By these provisions, it is clear that any presidential election that excludes certain parts of the nation will result in constitutional crisis and legal battles that may further heighten sectional tensions. Sign number five, impending post-election tension. This necessitates a look at those pointers to possible post-election tension. First, like the gathering of the clouds, the utterances of vested interests from the northern and southern sections of the country as to how they will re react if the election turns one way or the other is a pointer to an impending storm that the nation must not ignore. In recent times, direct threats in this regard have been coming from vested interests in the South-South with a history of militancy. This should give the nation a grave cause for concern when considered against the massive oil theft in the region, as well as reports suggesting arms build with ex-militants allegedly linked to a bought South African arms deal that was widely reported and to purchase and the purchase of six warships as reported in the Punch newspaper of December 13, 2014. Mind you, the Global Terrorism Index reported and identified six terror groups in Nigeria. Contrary to public perception, according to the report, even though Boko Haram is currently the deadliest terror group in the country and has laid claim to about 90% of the terror attacks in the period covered by the report, the largest terror group in Nigeria is the Movement for the Emancipation of the Niger Delta with a membership strength of about 15,000, despite its having recorded much fewer attacks than Boko Haram. That is the report I read. Ladies and gentlemen, one does not need a suit there to know this is a red flag. On the other hand, the readiness of the multitude of northern youth to violently defend what they perceive as theirs, rightly or wrongly, is well documented in our recent election experience, the nation will not want to be caught up in violence involving two regions. Another civil war in addition to terrorism will be too much weight on an ailing nation. Why not first address the root causes of these tensions that mount up every election year, root causes that elections themselves cannot resolve but aggravate? Sign number six. Looming economic collapse. Alongside these pointers to political upheaval are the signs of an impending economic collapse. Any of the following scenarios is possible. Number one, inflation. With the proposed diversification of revenue based from oil to taxation, 
and with the devaluation of the naira in an economy that is likely import dependent cost push inflation is likely to occur also the flow of money into the economy through politics within the first quarter of the year ahead of the elections could as well facilitate a demand pool inflation the so-called average nigerian who has no place on the dinner table will be at the brunt it is even doubtful that they can access the crumbs that fall from the master's table deflation number two with the expected reduction in government spending for a nation whose financial sector is still largely government supported and with likely reduction in purchasing power due to taxation and possible job cuts in the public as well as private sector a fall in aggregate demand will eventually lead to deflation an inflation deflation transition could result in losses for investors in voter volatile markets such as securities and property number three monetary collapse the depletion of our foreign reserves the deep in crude oil prices and its downward impact on our foreign earnings the weak state of our manufacturing sector and our import dependence could lead to a sustained downward spiral in the value of our currency we are therefore faced with the challenge of managing a volatile transition process and a looming economic downturn at the same time it will interest you to note that the same fundamentals that must be addressed in the political dimension of our challenges also hold the key to economic stability and prosperity for our beloved nation however before we take a look at these fundament fundamentals it is necessary to point out one more sign of the gathering storms that has to do with my constituency the church and its interactions with the political space in 2015 sign number seven potential religious confusion betrayals scandals and persecution in 2011 when i was selected by general buhari as running mate there was a gump gulp against that ticket by a substantial section of the church which preferred the candidate that was perceived as a christian dr goodluck jonathan not only was the church not convinced about General Buhari's non fundamentalist stance, it also refused to give support to the running mate, who in perception is controversial and non conformist. At that time, the mantra amongst many men of God was that a pastor had nothing to do with politics. Reports also have it that Christian clergy receive financial inducement one of them reported it to me if i'm put on the spot i will mention names reports also have it that christian clergy receive financial inducement from their preferred candidate who is again contesting against the same general buhari in 2015 to compound the matter general buhari's running mate is another pastor who should ordinarily have the support of his own church a very influential denomination in and outside of the country and whose head is highly respected in the christian establishment therefore ordinarily for those to whom religion means a lot in the making of electoral decisions the current running mate of the apc should be tiwantiwa that is our own and should be massively supported by the church but it's not going to be that easy what will be the implication of turning away from the incumbent who was massively supported in 2011 by the church establishment how about those to whom the president has done one favor or another such as waivers contracts soft landings protection of vested interests 
licenses in one form or another or even outright monetary gifts not necessarily bribery but a harmless gift Will, will these pastors, priests, and prophets now turn against their benefactor, the president, to give support to our own? What will be the position of the Christian Association of Nigeria, Can and the Pentecostal Fellowship of Nigeria organizations that have been massively behind the president and who are likely biased against APC? As PFN's 2015 round the clause circulated prayer bulletin reveals. Would there be reminders that this same incumbent has never before us at our conventions where we laid hands on him and supposedly endorsed him? Or will we make a U-turn now that this is our own? Will such a U-turn not come with their consequences? Reminiscent of the Abimelech experience with the men of Shechem in Judges chapter 9, verses 22 to 24. Judges 9, 22 to 24. After Abimelech had reigned over Israel three years, God sent a spirit of ill will between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech, that the crime done to the 70 sons of Jerubal might be settled and their blood be laid on Abimelech, their brother, who killed them, and on the men of Shechem, those who supported, who aided him in the killing of his brothers. Let us not forget that the men of Shechem paid dearly for it, with their lives intact. Do we see persecution looming for the church? A section of the church had started saying, From good luck to bad luck. I wonder what the other section of the church will say in the days to come. Do we see persecution looming? Do we see high profile scandals? Imagine if the church makes a U-turn. Or would the church simply deny or betray its own by the deniers that are going on now that we have not endorsed anyone? Would the church, like the ostrich deprived of wisdom, Treat its young harshly and choose to support incumbency in order to stay safe and protect waivers, interests, and investments. You said private jets, I didn't say so. <laughs> Would the question of support and endorsement pitch major religious leaders against one another? With brothers fighting against brother, whether in secret or in the open. See what the book of Job says about the ostrich church. The mega church that lacks wisdom. Job 39 from verse 13 to 18. The wings of the ostrich wave proudly. Better than wings, better than wings and pinions like the kindly strokes. For she leaves her eggs on the ground and warms them in the dust. She forgets that a foot may crush them or that a wild beast may break them. She treats her young harshly as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without concern. Why? Because God deprived her of wisdom and did not endow her with understanding. When she leaves herself on high, she scorns the rod. And his rider. He said, I can fly too. Challenging as all this may be, our confidence is in the fact that no matter the, de- the degree of betrayers and shaking that will occur, it will only produce a glorious church without spots or wrinkle. For Jesus, the true head of the church, had said, He will build this church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it.